My name's Megan. I'm a homeschool mom of two, and welcome to my channel. Oh, I am feeling extra sparkly today, and let me tell you why. I am so excited because in this video, I'm going to share with you guys how I evaluate U.S. history resources for my kiddos and share with you some U.S. history resources that don't totally stink. Spoiler alert, it's rough out there, y'all. So you know what? Let's get into it. First thing. As y'all know, the only thing, in my opinion, that qualifies anyone to be a home educator is a willingness to learn their, themselves and a drive to do what is absolutely best for their child. That being said, I wanna give you guys a little bit of my professional background before I became a home educator. Way back when, I worked and received two bachelor's degrees, one in history, specifically American history, and one in political science, because I, of course, wanted to grow up to be a billionaire. That's a little joke for all my liberal arts majors out there. I see y'all, okay? We followed our hearts and uh, not necessarily our wallets when choosing our degrees. After I finished college, I was a public high school teacher for five years, and I taught um, on-level United States history, advanced placement United States history, because I'm bougie like that, and advanced placement human geography, which I'm still scratching my head as to what exactly that is, okay? Um, in addition to teaching all of those subjects, I also wrote U.S. history curriculum um, for my district, as well as sat on a committee for evaluating and choosing textbooks for our district to purchase. So all of that being said, you guys, I have seen it all when it comes to United States curriculum. The good, the bad, the utmost ridiculous propagandist bull honky you can think of, I've seen it. So I wanna show you guys how I personally evaluate the validity of a US history curriculum resource, textbook, whatever. Let's go. As homeschoolers, we have the opportunity to teach our kids accurate and meaningful history. And believe you me when I tell you that that is something that is becoming a luxury in public schools. At the time that I was writing U.S. history curriculum, the state of Texas state standards for U.S. history mentioned Estee Lauder, the makeup entrepreneurs, twice, and mentioned slavery zero times. Oh, yikes. So we've made the decision and you guys have made the decision to homeschool but now you have to navigate the dumpster fire that is all of the resources out there. So let me help you. When evaluating the validity of a US history resource, the first thing I'm going to do is simply research the author. Now this is not always a determining factor for me, but when I am looking into this person, I'm basically checking for two things. Number one, I want to make sure that this person is well-educated on the subject matter and held in high and good standing with the academic community of their choice. I'm basically making sure that the author is somebody reputable and not someone's kooky uncle who lives in the basement and spends most of his day researching history and sending out his findings in a bizarre email chain to uh, relatives. I'm also looking to check that the person who wrote the resource is not synonymous with sexual assault or professional misconduct. That's just not my jam. I'm assuming it's none of y'all's either. Okay, you researched your author and they passed your internet background check. Now it's time to crack open that resource and take a little look at what's inside. History is a tricky subject because it isn't an exact science. 
We cannot study data that comes from a laboratory or repeat experiments over and over again. Instead, history is a collective memory. And like all memories, it's open to variance based on the experience of an individual or a particular group. Yes, we have primary source documents, records, and in more modern history video, but we also have a cultural narrative that has changed many times to suit all kinds of needs, both malignant and benign, but take solace in the fact that we live in an amazing time in which academia is blown wide open to hearing all sorts of American voices. No longer does United States history simply belong to white European Christian men, but it's multifaceted, a collective memory that belongs to all of us with many things to mourn, but also many, many things to celebrate. Okay, I'm gonna get off of my soapbox and let's get down to brass tacks. If I can only look at two things when evaluating the validity of a United States history resource, the first thing is going to be how the author interprets American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism is the idea that the United States of America is somehow ultimately unique and if not divine in time and space and that all of our political policies economic choices and history are above scrutiny or criticism now do not misunderstand me here i love america i put on my old navy flag shirt today just for this video and i do think that there are many things about our country that are indeed exceptional have you tried a french fry or, uh, I don't know, played Candy Crush on an iPhone before? Totally exceptional. If an author expresses an unwavering belief in American exceptionalism, then I'm out. How can a text be applicable to historical study if it's shaded by the decision that all of our choices throughout U.S. history were wise and just? What do we have to learn from anyone else in the world or even from ourselves if that's true? This is the same problem that I have with any resource that spends its first few pages trying to convince you of the fact that they are going to teach you the truth. It's definitely this idea, if you're going to, if your thesis is going to be that the United States is impeccably flawless, then prove it. Show me. Don't just tell me. Some texts are going to be really forthright with this concept of American exceptionalism. And this will usually display itself in hyperbolic language. Maybe they are describing the founding fathers as these extraordinary men who are above all type of scrutiny or flaw. They can also describe America or the United States or even their own resource as the story of the greatest country of all time. And I'm not denying that claim. I'm simply saying I'm not interested in a resource where the author has already distinguished their own bias. Most of the time, these ideas of American exceptionalism are going to display themselves in a bit more subtle fashion. So for example, if you're flipping through and you need to look at one or two particular items to see if that underlying neurosis of American exceptionalism is present, I would look at how the author describes or discusses um, the relationships between Native Americans and settlers of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. If it's describing the Puritans as having no other motive than to help the Native Americans, to convert the Native Americans, uh, then we're going to have a problem. So for example, let me show you the seal for the Massachusetts Bay Colony. I'm gonna put it up here. Obviously, this is pretty rough stuff. It definitely is showing an indigenous person wearing just leaves in Massachusetts during the winter. That's just ridiculous. But look at this speech bubble coming out of the indigenous person's mouth. Actually, as if to suggest that Puritans truly believed and were proselytizing the idea that we just want to help the Native Americans and they want our help as well. 
that's American exceptionalism versus showing a more balanced image, which would be that most Calvinists didn't even believe in their own salvation, much less that of Native Americans, and that they were often exploited for labor, resources, and land. Also, how does the text approach slavery? Is it using a cajoling language that is attempting to explain away the Europeans' actions or to dismiss the slave trade? Or is it assuming that you are an intelligent enough person who is capable of grappling with the concept that a nation rooted in liberty also enslaved an entire population for economic greed and in a basis of racial hatred? Again, if reviewing a text or resources overall depiction of slavery is too cumbersome, then simply look at what it lists as the causes of the American Civil War. In this instance, American exceptionalism will generally display itself in one of two ways. Number one, the North will be depicted as somehow an enlightened state that was vehemently opposed to slavery and therefore engaged in this moral war to to end this evil practice when in reality the North was simply acting on um, an attempt to reassert federal power over southern states that preemptively seceded with the election of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the second way that in the American Civil War we see American exceptionalism on display is if the South is somehow depicted as um, states who did not want to secede, but were simply doing so as a political action to defend the separation of power between the states and the federal government, which completely negates every single letter of secession from the Confederate states in which slavery is definitely listed um, as one of, if not their top reasons for secession. A good text is going to provide the motivations for both the North and the South in naked terms. In reality, most of the fighting of the Civil War was done by poor, destitute classes that were acting in some greater economic chess game between the North and the South. The idea of abolishing slavery in terms of a political movement did not come into the Civil War um, until later for the North and for Abraham Lincoln. I absolutely wish that I could report to you that from the onset, the North was acting in a true sense of heroism, but the facts don't bear that out. Of course, that doesn't lessen the burden that the South must carry for attempting to defend a slave society that they established and benefited from. Okay, the second most telling thing that I look at when evaluating the validity of a U.S. history resource is the idea of agency. Who does the author choose to highlight in American history? Who are the actors? Who is creating or writing American history? And when I'm looking to evaluate the idea of agency, it's really easy to look at two groups. The first being women specifically early colonial women. If the author chooses to ignore, I don't know, half of the human population, then we definitely have a problem. I've seen so many texts that by omitting the experience of colonial women, simply presents the image that they did not exist or were not actors in nation building. And that's simply not the truth. As a matter of fact, in areas such as Jamestown, we had women who, because of the lack of men, because of the lack of structured society, were holding positions that they never would have been able to have in Europe. And if you were in a more traditional position, or if these women were in more traditional positions in the household, they were typically the most industrious members of said household. Imagine if you moved to the United States, well, at this time, America, and you were devoid of all of the social structures that you had used to run your household in Europe. You cannot go to the store to buy fabric. You are having to make fabric, then make garments, then keep those garments in good condition, wash them, make the soap. There are not these structures um, of European society that you could use to your benefit to somehow ease your woes. Early colonial women 
kept the society afloat and working. And if your author does not even mention those women at all, then we definitely have a problem of agency. The second actors that I look at to see if they're given due agency is indigenous peoples. Are they described as having complex societies that predated European settlement, or are they simply some sort of backstory of tragedy in which the European manifest destiny simply railroads? I like it when a text will discuss how early indigenous peoples reacted to European settlers' treatment of children because they actually found corporal punishment or the way that Europeans engaged with their offspring to be quite offensive. Also, how are the indigenous peoples fight, or how is the indigenous peoples fight to protect their land and their life? Um, how is that depicted? Are we calling these things massacres, battles? What's the wording here? If you are giving um, a person or a group of people agency in American history, then you are allowing them to act and not simply be acted upon. Of course, another one that we look at is that of enslaved people. Are we looking at and describing enslaved people as simply receiving emancipation from the hands of the federal government? Or are we discussing the fact that by 1800s, there had been over 250 organized rebellions by enslaved individuals? These people were acting on their own behalf for their own benefit. And that does take me to the use of uh, primary source documents. Now, if you are using a primary source document to say that this gives us a complete and whole image of what history or what life was like in a certain time period, then you are ignoring the agency of everyone who was not allowed to participate in the creation of those primary source documents. You may need to look at what is not being said or what data is missing to really get a clear picture of um, this historical reference point. Ugh. Guys, that was a lot for me to get through. But if you're looking to invest your time or money into a United States curriculum resource, make sure that you are research researching the author of that text that you are looking at how that author presents or works with the concept of American exceptionalism and definitely looking at who the author decides to give agency to. Okay, that being said, let's get to the resources. I wanna give you some that don't totally stink. So let's do it. Come on, I need a little dancing after that. Also, I don't know if you notice, I probably can't tell, I put on some like sparkly red eyeshadow to go with my like red fireworks earrings to sub off my old navy flag t-shirt for this video. No, you don't care? Okay, let's get to the books. The first resource that I am going to share with you guys today is a traditional textbook resource that was created for advanced placement U.S. history classrooms. Uh, but you can find other editions of this on Amazon and that is Give Me Liberty, An American History Written by Eric Foner. I really love Eric Foner. He is well respected in his academic community. He's published a ton of books, not only textbooks, but smaller, um, more focused subject books. And he's just a really neat person. You can find him on YouTube where he will discuss different elements of his writing and maybe expand upon um, some of those more abstract historical ideas. I love this text because it goes from um, well beyond or well before 1491 all the way to modern history. This is not something I would use for elementary students. This is definitely an advanced middle school text or high school text, but I use it for myself as um, a reference point. You can see I've got mine tabbed up. It's because I used to teach with this one and he just loved it so much that um, I definitely asked if I could have it as a parting gift and me and it will never be separated. All right, looking inside of this text, some cool things that I want to point out to you guys. Each chapter begins with a really interesting timeline. The images are excellent and Foner gives agency to a 
wide variety of voices. So for example, in the chapter following the, following the American Revolution and the formation of the United States government, uh, Foner looks at how that affected minority groups. So for example, how did American, the establishment of an American government affect loyalists, Native Americans, women, freedmen, Catholics. It's looking at all of those groups and giving them agency into creating American history. It also includes several focus questions as well as primary source readings. You can also find, I think it's called Voices of Freedom, which is simply his text that is a pullout of uh, primary source documents, and it's really interesting as well. So I really love Eric Foner. If you are looking to give yourself an updated view of the United States history, he's just your guy. He's the greatest. I really enjoy this text a ton. You can see all of my little markings as well as in a lot of this stuff. Now I'm not going to be able to find it. But in a lot of these, I even have my little margin writings and highlights as well. As an educator, I really enjoyed this textbook for sure. Okay, the next three books that I want to share with you guys are not textbook resources. They are more traditional read aloud spines, and they're definitely something that you can start with younger kiddos as a read aloud. And you could get deeper into these texts as your children develop and get older. I will definitely start using these probably this year, especially when we get around traditional American holidays as a way to highlight or give agency to various groups. Okay, the first is um, Howard Zinn's A Young People's History of the United States. And this is a really cool book, and it is not like any other U.S. history that I've read or looked at before, because Howard Zinn's motivation is to give agency to common man, to the common man. So you can find all kinds of resources out there all day long to tell you what George Washington was doing or what Benjamin Franklin was doing or Andrew Jackson or JFK or whatever like great man in American history you're looking to talk about. Those resources are out there in abundance. What Howard Zinn does is bring you the voices of the working classes, the immigrant classes, uh, women, or specific underutilized or underdiscussed groups of people. And I really appreciate that. And so instead of taking the path through the American Civil War, for example, that most textbooks do, which is discussing uh, major turning points, major battles, which is by all means incredibly interesting, Howard Zinn is discussing what effects the Civil War had on slave populations, freedmen's populations, um, things like that. Definitely those untold stories, and I think it's incredibly fascinating. As a matter of fact, directly from chapter one, he goes into the Columbus and the Indians, not discussing the Europeans' perspective or Columbus's perspective, but what the indigenous people's perspective was on the arrival of these European settlers. And I think that's a story that, at least from um, European classrooms or, or Anglo-centric classrooms, I never really experienced other than in passing. And it does have some interesting like um, block illustrations as well as photo images. Um, and it goes through, it is uh, in brief because it is for young people. So it's a really quick kind of read. If you're just wanting to sit down and go over something specifically, um, it's gonna be pretty easy to find that. It's just a great resource for pulling attention and giving agency to um, some kind of under-discussed elements of United States history. The next book I'm really excited about, I already gleaned a ton of information from this text, and that is An Indigenous People's History of the United States. And again, these are for young people. So there are adult editions of these books, but these are some revised editions that make it briefer and easier to digest for younger readers. I have already greatly enjoyed this book because it is definitely giving agency and insight to what indigenous nations or populations were doing during these um, hallmark moments of American history. And it also really helps to reframe a lot of overused and honestly outdated concepts uh, of American history. For example, that is where I got the 
um, idea to look at the indigenous people's reaction to Calvinists versus just believing, or not that I ever believed this, but just being taught that Puritans had a purely, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Philanthropic, uh, motivation when it came to their interaction with Native Americans or indigenous peoples. So I really love this text. It's really well thought out. Um, and I just thought it was enjoyable from the get go. And as a parent, honestly, I don't always have time to sit down and get really in depth with a text. So having something like this that I could just pick up and get really into myself, I thought was really powerful and incredibly interesting. The last book that I have for you guys is another read aloud spine, and that's called A Different Mirror for Young People, A History of Multicultural America. And this is by Ronald Takaki. I'm really excited for this text because it gives agency to several different groups that we don't hear from a lot. Um, all the way from looking at the Chinese experience during the gold rush to the Japanese experience at Angel Island, which is the West Coast Ellis Island, as well as looking at the discrimination faced by Irish immigrants when they came to the United States. This is another one that's great for when you're looking at a linear, linear, linear history of the United States, pulling out and hearing from those groups directly. It has some excellent illustrations and images in it as well. And I think it is just another one of those texts that is going to bring um, a richer understanding of United States history to my homeschool classroom. All right, you guys, I hope you liked this video and I hope that you got something out of it. If it wasn't a good book recommendation, hopefully I've given you some tools and confidence for evaluating the validity of United States history resources out there because there's a lot and a lot of them are stinkers. So hopefully you guys can go out and dig through the dumpster diver, dumpster fire with more confidence. Y'all, I'm exhausted. I don't know why it took me so long to film this particular video. I guess it was because I wanted to make sure I gave my all and did my best for each of the individual sections. Remember, it is okay to grapple with our own history. I would say that it's healthy and academically necessary to dig through the mire and decide um, what the true story is there. We can still celebrate America and being Americans while being honest, right? I don't see any other way to be. So I hope this was helpful. Keep on homeschooling. If you want more resources, let me know because I am a history buff to say the least. So until next time, oh wait, is it done? Yeah, baby, it is. Is it perfect? It never was. All right, until next time. Bye.